So good morning, everybody. And uh, I agree, yesterday was a fantastic day. Um, a bunch of absolutely great scientists and, and really interesting conversation. And we've heard that five times this morning and they set the bar pretty high. So I'll try not to destroy it for, for the rest of the speakers that follow me, but we'll see where we go. Um, a special thanks also to, you know, uh, I guess they call you the working panel. The first thing I do, first, uh, first action I'd look for is a better name. Okay, working panel, come on, you can do better than that. So some sort of a stakeholder group or something like that. Um, what I'm going to try and, and keep most of my remarks will be really to you folks, uh, because you're the ones who are important here. Um, we're trying to get you geared up and ginned up to be able to make you know good recommendations on behalf of the people of the state of Michigan. So you're the important ones here today, at least in my opinion. So um, a little bit of background. And this slide doesn't keep up with that one, so I guess I'll have to turn around and keep an eye on this one up here. So uh, a little bit of background with regard to deer and deer management. White-tailed deer, elk, mule deer are considered non-migratory. Um, certainly some of them migrate, but they're terrestrial animals as, as opposed to you know, geese and ducks. Okay? They're not endangered other than, other than the key deer in Florida. So in that circumstance, uh, uh, delegation management authority goes down to the state level. Okay, so white-tailed deer really management are the purview of the states with a couple of exceptions. And I can hear him in the back already. It's eight o'clock in the morning and the Fed is already up there shirking responsibility. Pretty typical. So anyway, federal authority for white-tailed deer is only in a couple instances. One, it's on federal lands. So uh, National Forest Service lands, National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service lands, there the federal government has a stake in, in management of white-tailed deer. The other one is largely um, in the agricultural sector. When deer cross state lines, USDA has authority for management of that resource. So that when it comes into the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, where delegation of authority crossing state lines goes to USDA and the Fish and Wildlife Service underneath the Lacey Act for Ill unlawful movements of, of deer. Okay, so just a little bit of a background. And uh, so it also, uh, Kelly asked me to come in and she kind of assigned me a title, uh, the, the federal perspective or national perspective on CWD and wildlife. And well, I tried thinking about it and we don't really have, there's no uniform federal perspective on CWD. So really what you're gonna get today is a feds perspective on CWD. So we'll go from there, okay? I don't have the authority to speak on, on behalf of the entire federal government, let's put it that way. It's probably a good thing. All right. So the, the charge, and I gave you this name of a stakeholder committee. Uh, what you guys call yourselves is, is entirely up to you, I guess. But, but there have been a number of these in, in multiple different states, and the charge is usually pretty similar. And we heard a little bit of it this morning. You're going to learn a little bit about the background of CWD. You're going to take into account the relevant science. You're going to compare what other states and provinces have done. A lot of that's going to be today. And then, as it was identified, then comes the hard part, the deliberations, uh, putting together guidance to the state of Michigan. It'll be challenging, it'll be contentious, and I really hope you don't alienate uh, too many of your neighbors and, and friends and hunting partners and stuff like that, because it, be, it will be a big deal and a very contentious process, I assume. So good luck to you with that, and I, and I mean that very sincerely. All right, so a little bit of the background on the process that, you know, a typical process you might go through is, is establishing authority. And I'm not going to speak much to the authority of how you manage in the, in the state of Michigan, but you go back and you can look in the legislature and identify that populations of fish and wildlife are of paramount importance. Um, the, the conservation of fish and wildlife populations depends on wise use and sound scientific management, and sound scientific management is declared to be in the public interest. So pretty clear the legislature wants you folks to use science, you know, best science to manage uh, the natural resources of the state. The, the, the legislature also gave exclusive authority to the DNR to manage uh, wildlife populations in the state and gave them clear guidance to use principles of sound scientific management when you're making decisions regarding the taking of game. So again, reiterated that science is a big thing. Now, your Natural Resources uh, Commission has also developed uh, and implemented 
a, a wildlife disease policy. So the department shall monitor for diseases in an effort to detect and control significant wildlife diseases. Uh, they will investigate significant outbreaks of significant diseases. And the commission will make every effort to use sound science in concert with its authority to mitigate risks and consequences of wildlife disease. Science keeps popping up there all the time in the charges from the legislature and from the commission. So um, hopefully, and I mean, the science that was brought to you yesterday was fantastic and will help you along that way. Now, when we get over onto the captive side, and, and Tracy's going to speak to the, to the captive side a little bit later, um, authority for captive survey day is relegated largely to the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. And I don't have statutory citations for them, but I bet you'll be able to come up with them. So the state of Michigan is kind of a, a, a model where you've got dual management over kind of the same resource, white-tailed deer, DNR over the wild side, and agriculture over the captive side. Many states have adopted this model. In some states, it works quite seamlessly. Uh, Dale Garner from the state of Iowa has, a, has an absolutely wonderful relationship with the Department of Agriculture. They work in concert. They work hand in hand. In other states, that relationship might be better described as a work in progress. So we've got that responsibility. So the next big thing I think this, this uh, panel will have to determine is, is CWD important? And I bet if we took a, a straw poll in this room, we would find very different opinions about whether CWD, some folks would say CWD is a really big issue. Other folks might disagree. They go, man, eh, not so big of a deal. Uh, maybe it's something we can learn to live with. So that's a decision that this group is going to have to struggle with. And I, and I can assure you that the stakeholders in the state of Michigan have differing opinions of whether CWD is serious, whether it's something you should spend any time on at all. So I'm going to go through uh, just some data, some information, which might help you or might help you form your opinion. I put this photograph of a deer up here because, you know, yesterday we saw a lot of photographs of, of deer with CWD and they all looked that kind of droopy, skinny, drooling, loss of fear of humans and stuff like this. Well, this deer could easily have CWD. This is what deer with CWD look with, like pretty much the majority of the incubation period. So if we take that average garden variety deer has an incubation period of CWD probably around two years, for the first 20 months, it's going to look just like that. So that's a problem from that, um, it's a problem from multiple standpoints, problem from a management standpoint. How do you identify that thing? It's a problem from talking to your stakeholders, convincing your stakeholders that CWD is a problem. Most hunters have never seen a sick deer in the woods. So we're trying to explain to them that, that CWD might be a serious issue, but they've never seen a sick deer. They look like that until the very end of the disease. So it's a challenge. It's a communications challenge to the stakeholders. So little data we can go through to help ascertain whether CWD is a big deal. With respect to deer, we might look at geographic spread. Okay. This is a map of where we knew CWD was prior to the turn of the century. It's not necessarily a map of where CWD was. We know that certainly if CWD was in Wisconsin, we just hadn't detected it yet. Okay, so this is where we knew CWD was. Dr. Fisher identified the, uh, yesterday about the potential movement of captive cervids from South Dakota into Saskatchewan that seeded, that seeded it into the captive cervid industry in Saskatchewan. That had already taken place by the year 2000. Contrast that with what we know the distribution to be today. Now, it could be an underestimate of distribution, but this is the documented distribution of CWD as of right now. Other than I understand we may have uh, a couple new um, positives identified or confirmed in the last couple of days. So the, the map's a little bit out of date. Um, one of the things that I regularly hear, well, this doesn't demonstrate geographic spread. It just as easily may demonstrate that we're doing more surveillance or a better job with surveillance. That's an interesting, that's an interesting point. So what I've done is I've taken that data and gone back and identified the year when each county first detected CWD. And so, at least to me, I can see kind of a pattern of spread there. The yellow counties are where CWD was detected early on, and the darker the color is the more recent the detection. 
So if you look out there in the Colorado and Wyoming, at least I can kind of see that pattern of starting in the core and the, and the detections moving out, really suggesting a pretty strong suggestion of geographic spread. Same thing if you look in Wisconsin and northern Illinois. You've got the lighter colors, the earlier detections there, and the more recent detections are in that radiating pattern, suggesting that slow deer-to-deer -deer diffusion of disease across the landscape. Geographic spread. Another interesting example, I think, uh, that portrays geographic spread quite well is in the state of Wisconsin. And the state of Wisconsin has collected now well over 200,000 samples, CWD samples, more than probably multiple other states combined. It's the richest data set that, that researchers have to deal with with regard to uh, surveillance samples, and very powerful analyses have been done, a lot of papers published based upon that data. So in 2001, the first three were detected during the hunting season. They didn't announce it till 2002 when the test results came back. Uh, they're isolated in Western Dane County. The next year, 2002, the state of Wisconsin collected over 40,000 samples to try and determine how big this thing is and how bad it is. Okay, trying to do that outbreak surveillance uh, to try and determine scope, magnitude of the issue. They found 200 additional positives in largely in a cluster, and then there was a little flyer down there out in Walworth County. That turned out probably connected to the outbreak in, in Illinois, northern Illinois. But anyway, that's a, a pretty good portrait. Now let's flash through the years. 2003, four, five, six. I think this, this slide set really does help portray or demonstrate geographic spread, kind of from that core area, moving up there on the Wisconsin River Valley. And the height of those polygons indicates the number of positive deer that have been reported in an individual section in a square mile land. We got a couple where over the course of the 15 years, we've got 60 positives, 100 killed positives in a single section, and we don't do 100% surveillance anymore. So how, you know, it indicates there's a lot of CWD there. Okay, so one of, the, one of the things I hear is, well, again, the state of Wisconsin is looking harder for CWD, and that's why we're finding it in more locations. This is a sampling effort. So you can see the state of Wisconsin looked really hard up through 2006. In 2007, the legislature um, had a say on, on the amount of funding and, that was going into CWD. And in 2012, the federal allocation for uh, surveillance and management in CWD went away. So you can see the diminishing amount of surveillance in the state of Wisconsin, but yet in 2016, I believe there were 440 positives detected out of that, out of that sample size. So diminishing effort, finding more positives. And uh, there's, there's a lot of positive deer in, in southwestern Wisconsin. It's undeniable. Okay, so next thing we might look at is is an increasing prevalence trend, at least in local geographic areas. First one we'll take you out is the South Converse area in Wyoming, and uh, Dr. Wood will be speaking about this a little bit later, uh, where we see kind of a trend line of increasing prevalence matched with a, with a trend line downward of, of a population. Now, I can't say that it's a cause and effect, but there certainly seems to be a correlation there. You also see that line, um, the prevalence line, really bouncing around there. There's a lot of noise there. That year that it looks like it's at 75%, it was a sample size of four, and three were positive. Okay, so you know, take that into account. When you look at these numbers, relatively small sample sizes, and you anticipate a lot of noise. But take a look at the trend line. The trend line does seem to be going up. Now let's go over to the state of Wisconsin. And you take a, where that red circle is, is north central Iowa County in Wisconsin. And in that zone, we have some of the highest prevalence um, anywhere. Let's put it that way. Adult male deer, two and a half years and older, have a prevalence on average of 50% in that area. So if you go out hunting and you kill that three and a half year old buck, literally flip a coin as to whether that deer has CWD. Now, what's more interesting, though, as Dr. Samuel pointed out yesterday, is what happens with adult females. We've got adult female prevalence in that zone in excess of 30%. And I think, I think Mike yesterday mentioned that 20, 25% range where you start thinking about potential population impacts. So we're getting into that zone. 
Another thing I find very interesting, look at those yearling prevalences. We've got prevalence in 18-month-old animals, both male and female, you're hanging in the in the 25% range. Okay, Mike also talked yesterday about direct versus indirect or environmental transmission, and that at some point, perhaps environmental contamination and indirect transmission might become more of a factor. This is a place where where that could actually be occurring. But a pretty significant issue when you've got yearlings, 18 months of age, and one out of four of them has CWD. So. Uh, that's a, a pretty interesting place to study, and the Wisconsin DNR has started up a five-year study of including deer and CWD and predators in this zone. So it'll be really interesting to watch the results there. All right, so we talked about geographic spread, we talked about prevalence increasing locally, and I think it's an open question whether those local population impacts will start to be felt, um, you know, your high prevalence will be, occur on larger geographic scales. Next is population impacts, and we won't go through much of this, but we've seen it now published in mule deer, where in the state of Colorado identified compelling evidence that CWD epidemics can impact uh, population dynamics. Seen the same thing in Rocky Mountain elk at the uh, at uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, where the researchers conclude that CWD can exceed natural rates of mortality, reduce survival of adult females, and decrease population growth. We've also seen it published now in white-tailed deer, also in the state of Wyoming, where the researchers concluded that you know, when CWD becomes endemic in wildlife populations, it has the potential to be population limiting, and the strong population level effects of CWD suggest affected populations are not sustainable at high disease prevalence under the current harvest levels. So we've now got peer-reviewed publications in all three of our, of our major species with CWD, suggesting that if CWD is on the ground long enough, prevalence gets high enough that population impacts will be felt, at least on a localized basis. And the open question, again, is whether that will extend out to regional basis. Okay. We talked yesterday, um, is there kind of, is there, will Mother Nature take care of this? You know, with EHD, you have these great, you know, huge outbreaks, massive declines of deer, and then winter comes, kills all the midges, and the outbreak, the disease transmission cycle is broken. To date, we have not identified any such natural feature out there which, which is going to break the CWD cycle. Yesterday, we talked about um, a little bit about the potential for um, genetic resist, genetically resistant or quote unquote resistant animals uh, that they might uh, be part of the solution to CWD. Uh, some research in, in Colorado, uh, Dr. Miller, Lisa Wolf, and Karen Fox did a study, published a study a couple years ago on some of these um, um, resistant animals. Some of their conclusions I think are kind of interesting. And, and Dr. Nichols uh, said yesterday, you know, Mother Nature abhors these things for some reason. We don't really know why, but she does not like these things. And the researchers, they were able to breed up some of these genetically resistant animals and identified the few individuals we have observed tended to behave somewhat erratically, have poor hair coats, less optimal body condition, and poor fawn recruitment. And these traits, if representative, may help explain the rarity of this genotype in natural populations, even in the presence of CWD. So at the top, I talk about genetic fitness. And the definition of genetic fitness is how well represented you are, your genotype is, in the next generation. So if these alleles are only out there in the heterozygote and the homozygote at 20% or less of the population, by definition, these animals are not genetically fit. They're not represented well. So there's got to be a reason for this. So if we're looking towards, you know, these as a solution to CWD, you got to ask yourself, is this a solution that, we, that is desirable? Will it occur? Only time will tell. So that's kind of a whirlwind of the, of, the, of the deer world. And I'm not a medical professional um, for human health. Um, so I'm going to keep this very, very brief. That's another thing. Dr. Fisher and Dr. Miller's paper identified the two reasons you might be concerned about CWD is one is the impact on deer, and the other is the potential uh, for human health impacts. So I'll try and boil it down. There's been a lot of research done. And near consensus in that research is that conversion can take place. 
at a very low level. Okay, multiple different studies have concluded that. But from an epidemiologic standpoint, we have no identified cases where CWD has crossed over into a human host. So we have to conclude that there is a remote but positive risk of that transmission. And some of the recent science, including the macaque study that was discussed yesterday, um, has helped maybe suggest that that species barrier may not be as robust as we once thought it to be. Uh, the new studies didn't change the risk. They help elucidate what risk may have been there all along. Okay. So in response to that science, so we talked a little bit about the World Health Organization and the CDC. World Health Organization has been very, very consistent in their guidance. They identify if an animal has a TSE, transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, CWD is an example. If an animal has that, no part of that animal should enter the human or animal food chain. Pretty straightforward guidance advice. Centers for Disease Control has modified theirs slightly, and their current guidance is for hunters. When you're hunting in an area with CWD, you should strongly consider having that deer or elk tested for CWD. And if it tests positive, don't eat it. That's their advice. Okay, I'm not making that up. It's direct from the website. So you've got both the CDC and the World Health Organization very consistent saying if it has a TSC, keep it out of the human food chain. All right, so that's all I've got for you with regard to you know your determinations, things that you might look at to help determine whether CWD is something important enough to act upon. And if your determination it is, well, then it gets hard. And I love this cartoon. I'd never seen it before. Yesterday, it was in somebody's slideshow, so I had to go find it last night. But this is really, you know, this is exactly the devil's in the details. It's all so easy until you get down to, you know, where the rubber meets the road. And CWD management, like so many other wildlife management things, are very, very challenging. So I'm going to come back to Michigan just for a little bit. And I'd say you have two issues with CWD right now. You've got CWD down in these south, um, southern counties, uh, potentially three counties, but it's pretty small scale. You found uh, nine confirmed and maybe 10, maybe a 10th one in a fairly restricted geographic area. Highlighting those entire counties dramatically overestimates where you know CWD is. Then you've got the rest of the state. And as Dr. Fisher identified yesterday afternoon, if you ask the states that have CWD what you should do, you should do everything you possibly can to keep, from, to keep it that way, to keep from getting CWD. So to me, those are your problems. And then there's an open question. You found nine, maybe 10, in a restricted geographic area. Is CWD established in that free-ranging herd? Because we know that once CWD is established, success Successful management uh, um, is pretty pretty slim. The opportunities for successful management are few. Okay, so I don't have, and I don't think anybody has a dictionary definition for established, but it's probably like some of those other definitions of things on the internet that you'll know it when you see it. Um, so it's up to this crew, but it's, once it's established, it's pretty hard. Okay, so some some steps for dealing with disease in wildlife, disease, dealing with disease in humans, dealing with disease in, uh, in agriculture. Pretty much the same steps are involved. Pretty simple stuff. Prevention, prevention, prevention. If you don't have it, keep it that way, right? Minimize the potential for disease spread. So if you have disease in a small geographic area, in captive facilities, probably should try and consider measures to prevent that from spreading anymore, or do the best you can to try and minimize the potential for spread. Monitor for new outbreaks. You're doing that right now. You're doing surveillance. In fact, the, the bow kill uh, that may be positive in, in your third county there was an, was an example of that. You're monitoring in a geographic area, looking for new outbreaks. And then if you find that new outbreak, you go back in, you conduct another round of surveillance to try and figure out how big, how bad. It was it a spark or is it, is, it, is it an extension of that area? You have to go back in and do more surveillance to try and figure that out. Here's the tough one, okay? I don't have a recipe for success. I don't have a silver bullet. I wish I did. 
but managing infection rates within the affected area, that's a challenge, and that's one that this group is really going to have to deal with. What are the steps, what are the, what are the tools you want to bring to bear to try and, try and manage those infection rates, okay? Support research. Um, it was Dr. Williams had a slide up there yesterday afternoon that showed, um, you know, the end of federal funding for CWD science or the great, the great, um, you know, diminishing uh, availability of funds. And the number of peer-reviewed publications in basic science just kind of took a downward spiral. Well, that's a problem. Because if we don't have the tools, the scientific tools to know how to effectively manage CWD today, where are we going to get those tools if we don't support additional research? Provide timely, complete, accurate information to stakeholders. Be transparent. That's the best advice I can give you. In this day and age, trying to hide something or, or not being public with information is pretty much generally a bad thing, OK? Keep your deliberations open, transparent, the rationale. Do the best you can, OK? So as I said, this is pretty, pretty simple stuff, simple steps. And actually, it came from a document that was put together in 2004 called the Multi-State Guidelines for CWD. 26 states were signatories to this non-binding set of advice, what states might think about doing if and when they detect CWD. And Michigan was one of the, the 26 states that was a signatory to this. Um, it's a pretty good, pretty good document. It's uh, relatively short, straightforward. Um, it, it might be something that the committee wants to take a look at and include in, in, the, in the things they're working on. So this advice is out there, has been out there for a long time. All right, so we talked about prevention, 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 how key it is. And so we can, we can divide up risks into these introduction risks. How could CWD come to you? And then amplification risks. Um, we've got an example over there of an amplification risk. Um, Dr. Samuel talked about that yesterday. If you concentrate animals in the same space and time and drop a little infectious agent in the middle of it, you would expect that the risk of transmission in that environment is greatly enhanced, right? So high population densities, feeding and baiting, uh, easily could be seen as, as associated with, with enhanced risk. Introduction risks, game farm movements, uh, contacts through fence, hunter carcass movements, great big one that we, we discussed yesterday. Number of different ways So CWD can walk to you People might bring it to you, and people could bring it to you in a number of different fashions. Uh, raw taxidermy, contaminated soil. A few years ago, uh, we heard of, of bow hunters that were purchasing urine-soaked soil to use as a lure, as an, as an attractant. Is that risk? Uh, potentially. Uh, urine-based lures, I'm not even going to get into that one, but we, we certainly know that urine can carry infectivity. Can it carry enough infectivity to cause transmission? I don't think we know, but we did hear from Dr. Hoover yesterday that out in the environment, it takes a very, very small dose of infectivity to infect a deer. So open question. Movement of farm commodities. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but we, we, we discussed the, the plant uptake and plant contamination. So um, is, it, is it something we need to be concerned about? If you're looking at risk, it's probably something that, that merits at least a discussion. Put it that way. And uh, let's see, how do, you, how do you deal with risk? Um, I think it's really important. You can't just regulate risk. If people don't have an understanding of why it's a risky behavior, why is moving a carcass across the landscape a risky behavior? If they don't understand why, they're much less likely to comply, right? All right, so the first map I showed you was of, of just of the state of Michigan, but you don't live in a vacuum. Risk is out there, and, and certainly there's probably risk in some of your neighbors. Uh, the shaded counties are where CWD has been detected, so it's not, not beyond belief that CWD could walk to you to the southeastern portion of the state. Of course, you'd have to go through part of Chicago and Gary, so it'd be a little bit tough, but it's possible they could, they could make it through. We also have captive facilities on, on the map there. I'll highlight these three facilities in northern Wisconsin. And uh, the common, these, are, these are what I refer to as shooter facilities, so they don't ship live deer. They're, they provide opportunities to, to shoot you know, animals okay, on, a, on a fee basis. 
Each of these three facilities has now had multiple positives. If you add them up from all three, I believe there are over 20 positives that have been detected in these facilities. These are in areas of the state of Wisconsin where CWD has not been detected in free-ranging deer. Um, it's also been um, determined that the state will not um, attempt to depopulate these facilities. So they're going to leave these facilities positive out there on the landscape and allow them to continue to do business. Does this constitute a risk to the free-ranging deer in northern Wisconsin? And if it would spill out of those facilities, does that constitute a risk to the Upper Peninsula, which is about a stone's throw from one of those facilities? So just trying to elucidate risk out there on the landscape. Uh, yesterday, um, there was conversation about, uh, about late in the afternoon about um, the uh, certification program in USDA. And I was able to pull some numbers. And uh, in Canada, we got 96 CWD positive captive service facilities. In the States, it was 83. I could be a couple behind. Okay. Uh, since 2012, 30 captive facilities in the, in the United States have been determined to be CWD positive. When you go back and kind of categorize what these facilities were about, uh, some were these shooter facilities, one was an exhibition facility, and 21 were categorized as breeder facilities. So they really, they do move live deer, okay? Of the 21 that uh, went positive over the five-year period, 12 of those had been monitoring, whole herd monitoring uh, their mortalities for at least five years, and nine of those 12 were enrolled in the USDA program at the time they went, po they went positive. The data for that slide, I think, is important. That came from states, uh, natural resource agencies, agricultural agencies, and some of it came from USDA. So it's data that's out there, okay? Risk. Boy, talk about risk. Uh, this one comes back to the hunters. Uh, hunter coming to Wisconsin, hunter going to Colorado, hunter going to Wyoming, uh, coming back with that trophy animal, whatever it may be, butchering it themselves. Well, what do I do with the carcass? Well, I'm going to take it to the landfill, and I'm on the way to the landfill. They go past a four, uh, county road or something like that and see a situation like that. Uh, boy, if that's not risk on the landscape, I don't know what is. So again, we have to educate our stakeholders, our constituents, why this is a risky situation and give them alternatives. As it was pointed out yesterday, moving a carcass across state lines is not risk. It's only risky when it ends up out on the landscape and that infectious material, if there is any, becomes bioavailable to healthy, susceptible, naive animals. That's risk, okay? have another situation that, that came up that was pointed out just uh, about two weeks ago. And this is unlawful movement of, of captive white-tailed deer across multiple state lines. This is a facility in, um, in Pennsylvania uh, where multiple animals over an uh, extended time period were moved out of a facility in Pennsylvania through the states of Indiana where sometimes they picked up additional deer down into Arkansas and finally across the border into Mississippi. Mississippi has had a ban on movement of white-tailed deer into the state for eight or nine years, maybe a little bit longer than that. So that made the entire movement under the Lacey Act, if these alleged acts occurred, makes it unlawful under the Lacey Act. Now you'll note that um, in 2012, so they moved deer. Later on in 2012, the facility, one of the facilities where these deer came from was determined to be CWD positive. It was in Adams County, Pennsylvania. So we don't know whether they move CWD positive deer, but we do know that they move, likely move CWD exposed deer across multiple state lines. Okay, so risk. Risk is out there. Finally, we'll talk a little bit more about risk. This one's a touchy subject. I noted this on the news um, earlier this spring. Uh, there was uh, fire, drought conditions in southern Kansas. Farmers in west central Wisconsin doing their absolute best to help out you know, their neighbors multiple states away. So they loaded up uh, big trailers of these big square bales of hay, moved them down to Kansas you know, to help, help out with the situation. Uh, a genuine, you know, heart-touching effort. And I thought, where do these things come from? Okay, these hay bales came from a CWD-affected area. Now, it's not 40%, but it's probably 10% prevalence. So is there a possibility that deer were out there defecating, urinating, salivating out in the same hay fields where these square bales of hay were baled up? And then we moved these bales of hay, these agricultural commodities, across multiple state lines 
and we feed it to cattle. Well, could deer or elk come in contact with that infectious material? And could that result in transmission? Open question, but I think it's one that, you know, it needs to be part of the conversation. It's, it could happen. It's the end of risk. Okay, so boil down that management. Preventative measures are key. And if you do have CWD, it's going to be challenging if CWD is established in that population, both on logistical and on political and social realities. It's a, it's a challenge. Here's what I'll give you a grand total of two cents worth, and you can take it or leave it. But this is, comes from my observations. I've worked with several of these committees over, over quite a long period of time. Grasp new science, but place it in context. Not every new paper is going to tell you something that's critically important from a management perspective. At breakfast, the topic of, of could crows be a part of, of this situation? Uh, and, and certainly now science has shown that if you put CWD in the front end of a crow, if you put it in the front end of a coyote, CWD comes out the back end of the crow or the coyote some period of time later. So it's a potential mechanism for transport of infectious material. But we have to ask ourselves, are, are deer likely to consume uh, you know, defecate from crows or coyotes? So while we can show it, proof of concept in a laboratory, we have to ask ourselves, does this really occur in the natural world and how big of an issue it is? So put science in context. Look to scientists for their advice. Look to managers for management advice. Uh, th it came up yesterday. Uh, there's been some recent advice coming from a, a fantastic scientist out west regarding fire, the use of fire to help uh, um, mitigate CWD and environmental contamination on the landscape. Well, proof of concept could be in a laboratory, but we saw the, the, the vast geographic distribution and start asking the deer managers and the wildlife managers whether fire is a tool that they will really be able to put to use on a broad scale. So let's say scientists, science, managers for your management advice. There's, and you'll hear a lot of that today from states that have been dealing with CWD for a long time. So take their advice to heart. Gimmicks and quick fixes. Each state, not each state, I shouldn't say that. I've seen instances in states where, hey, we could try this. Uh, maybe we could tweak antlerless harvest a little bit. Maybe we could repeal those APRs just a little bit. Another state was, um, hey, if we let farmers shoot deer from their tractors, they'll be better able to harvest clinical deer, and that might take care of it. Gimmicks and small measures have met with limited to no success. So I urge you to consider, if, you know, if somebody comes up with the silver bullet that nobody's thought of before, there's probably a reason nobody's thought of it, you know, could well be. So pay attention to those types of things. Recognize and embrace the DNR's expertise. You are so fortunate. Your wildlife health team has, is one of the pioneers in this country. They've been around forever. You have expertise beyond belief. Listen to them. Take their advice sincerely. They've been around. They really know what they're talking about. And hats off to Russ Mason for, for helping assemble such a fantastic team. You know, you've, you've got the best right here in the state of Michigan. Use them to your, use them. Assess the risk and the risks. Assess that risk of CWD out there and the risks which may help move CWD across the landscape or bring CWD to areas of the state where you don't have it right now. Keep this in the back of your mind. I didn't look up, uh, does anybody know what the value of hunting in deer are in the state of Michigan? I bet it's hundreds of millions of dollars annually, if not closing in on a billion, someplace in there. Tremendous value of that resource. So it's not a small thing that you're tasked with, okay? It's not very small at all. Keep that in the back of your mind and act accordingly, okay? So I'm gonna close with, with a quote uh, from Beth Williams. And Beth was a friend and, and I agree with the sentiment that was expressed yesterday. It was a tremendous loss when we lost Beth and, and Tom back in 2004. And I think the CWD world and the world in general would have been a lot better if they were here with us, here with us today. Beth was asked, in 1996, when CWD was first detected in game farms in Saskatchewan, what Saskatchewan should do? Should CWD spill out 
Okay, and her advice really doesn't pertain just to leaking out from a from a captive facility. I think it pertains to all those situations where you have a, a recent introduction of CWD. Sage advice: remove all sources and all potential movement. Okay, both of those are really important from a management standpoint. Cut wider and deeper than you ever think necessary. The deer will come back, but you'll get one chance. If CWD gets widely established, you'll have it for a very long time. Well, that I'll close. And I guess we'll have time for questions later. So thank you and, and really good luck you know, to this committee. Um, you, have a, you have a challenging task and I, I'm, I'm sure you're up to it. Good luck.